All right. Hello. Welcome to History of Money. Professor Barth here, history professor at Arizona State University. We are in Lecture 22, moving right along in our history of the United States dollar. We are now into the 19th century. And today we're going to take a look at some bubbles. The first American financial bubble in today's lecture. Now, if you'll recall from two lectures ago, lecture 20, we talked about this debate between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. If you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. Jefferson and his party, the Democratic Republicans, win the presidential election and take over the House of Representatives in the year 1800. And it appears, perhaps, that Jefferson's vision for America has won out. Hamilton is killed in a duel in 1804. The Federalist Party slowly goes away, disappears by the 1810s. Jefferson had a two-term administration. In the first half of his term, he purchased Louisiana territory from France, a pretty spectacular uh, move by the United States that greatly expanded its territory and seemed to secure the future of an agricultural republic of small farmers that Jefferson envisioned. In 1804, he just absolutely swept the election. His Federalist opponent only took two states. Jefferson even won New England, which generally was a Federalist stronghold. Um, Jefferson ran into a little bit of trouble in his second term with foreign policy. Got a little bit wrapped up in, in the, uh, the uh, conflict with Britain and France at the time. And Napoleon was taking over Europe and Jefferson decided to place an embargo on all trade with England and France until they guaranteed that they would protect American shipping on the high seas. Didn't work out, wrecked the economy actually. And, uh, but nonetheless, I, his successor, James Madison, was also from the same party, a Democratic Republican. Madison argued in 1791 that the Bank of the United States, the bill to charter a bank in the United States, was unconstitutional. He's elected president, serves two terms. There's the electoral map in 1808. Federalists got a, had a little bit of a comeback there because of the, the bad economy due to the embargo. But it was in his first term that the Bank of the United States, the charter, expired. You'll remember the Bank of the United States had a 20-year-long charter, and it expired, ran out. There was a bill to recharter the bank. It went to the House and lost by a single vote. So barely, barely missed recharter. Um, and believe it or not, actually, by this point in time, the Bank of the United States, uh, people have become more comfortable with it. Jefferson and Madison left it alone. Yes, they thought it was unconstitutional in the 1790s, but now it's here. And, and there were some people within their party, many people within their party, especially of the merchant classes, who grew to you know, somewhat be okay with the Bank of the United States. Perhaps it, it hadn't turned out to be quite the monster that they had, uh, that they had feared in the early 1790s. The Bank of the United States, the first bank of the United States, operated somewhat conservatively. When the bank expired in 1811, it had assets of $5 million of, of gold and silver coins, so strong, specie backing in its vaults, $5 million of coin in its vaults, and demand obligations, banknotes and demand deposits, that only totaled about $13 million. So you, it was run very carefully, cautiously, conservatively, a reserve ratio of just shy of 40%, which is quite high, uh, quite a conservative ratio. Nonetheless, the bill was defeated by a single vote. And so it seemed, wow, Jefferson, him and his crew won, won the battle. Not so quick, uh, not so fast. Uh, you'll remember from lecture 21, the market revolution. The US economy is, is running f full speed. 
And what does this economy want? This economy wants credit, credit, credit. And that credit's got to come from somewhere. And if you're not going to have a bank in the United States, fine. But we're going to need lots of state chartered banks. And sure enough, these state chartered banks, which we looked at briefly uh, in, in the previous lecture, state chartered banks are not chartered by the federal government. They can't branch outside of their state, but they can issue banknotes. They operate on a fractional reserve basis. And between 1800 and 1811, there was a fourfold increase in the number of these banks in the United States these state charter banks, 117 of them. And in that number 117, these are not 117 branches of you know a smaller number of banks. These are 117 independent banking corporations, institutions that themselves have branches within their own state. And they each issue notes. And so there's lots of paper money still in this economy after that bank in the United States expires in 1811 and they circulate alongside one another usually at par so you know this is a five dollar note that's a five dollar note that's a five dollar note that's a, well all these are five dollar notes excuse me except this three dollar note here in most cases these five dollar notes are all going to circulate at par meaning people won't really distinguish much between these notes that wasn't always the case we'll look at some instances of that later so that's the system. That's the monetary system. Lots of paper money. And in fact, economic historians estimate that around this time, about 70% of the total currency in circulation were banknotes. 70%. 30% was coin. And of that 30% of coin, many, much of that was Spanish. The Spanish piece of eight remained in circulation in the U.S., legal tender in the U.S. until 1857. So that's the currency outlook. And then a war broke out. A war broke out in the year 1812 between the new nation, the United States of America, and Great Britain. Now, Great Britain at the time was also at war with Napoleon on continental Europe. So Britain is fighting multiple wars here. Puts them at a disadvantage. Uh, why does this war happen? Eh, it's kind of beyond the scope of this class. I talk about it at length in my U.S. history survey, but in short, um, the British were arming Indians on, on the uh, U.S. frontier. That was a cause of complaint. British, um, the British Navy was seizing American ships who were trading with the French, um, impressing or enslaving American sailors who were on those ships, um, impressing them into the Royal Navy, uh, and, and a number of other problems. Most of the fighting took place in the Great Lakes region, although at one point the British Army invaded Washington, D.C. and burned down the White House. And the, most, uh, the war lasted through 1814, so it lasts about two years. And the most famous battle of the war actually took place after the war was over, but the news traveled so slowly in those days they hadn't gotten the word yet. And so uh, Andrew, General Andrew Jackson fought the British at the Battle of New Orleans a few months after the war ended in early 1815. The war, nobody really won the war. There was no territory exchange. Nonetheless, the Americans staved off the British, held their own, and for that it was considered a fair, fairly triumphant war for the, for the new republic. Um, uh, American nationalism rose as a result of this war. The Star Spangled Banner was written by Francis Scott Key during this war. Um, in New England, uh, industry and manufacturing got a boost from the war, creating, um, producing armaments and uniforms and, and all the rest. But for our purposes, in this history of money class, it also was a very expensive war and required a lot of borrowing. Now, there's no longer a bank in the United States. So where is the government going to turn to to borrow money? Well, they go to the state banks. And so the government turned to the state banks, borrowed money from those banks, and then used those bank notes that they borrowed from the state banks and spent them on supplies, whatever, all, everything that you need to, to any expense in wartime. Look at that number. So between 1800 and 1811, there was a fourfold increase. And then between 1811, 1811 and 1814, nearly double the number of banks 
202. The record was uh, in a single month in March 1814, the state of Pennsylvania chartered 41 banks, 41 banks in a single month in March 1814. Prior to that, they only had four banks in the entire state. Why are these banks created? Well, again, uh, uh, the demand for credit, especially from the government in the midst of wartime. Um, more banks equals more paper money. Okay, so there's a lot more paper money created during this war. However, here's the big caveat. There's not necessarily more coin, right? There's not more coin. Well, how do you get more paper money if you don't have more coin? Well, what you do is you decrease the reserve ratio. The reserve ratio. The reserve ratio is a percentage of demand obligations of banknotes or demand deposits that are literally physically backed by coin or specie in the vault. So if you have if you're a bank and you issue ten thousand dollars worth of notes and you have three thousand dollars of coin in the vault, your reserve ratio is thirty percent. But if you're a bank and you have ten thousand dollars of notes and only $1,000 of coin in the vault, you have a reserve ratio of only 10%. Now, that allows you to create more currency, more paper money on a, a uh, lower stock of reserves in your vault. However, it also puts you at great risk because it means that you're, at, you're in a fairly precarious situation. And if at any time, People start coming into the bank to redeem these obligations, whether banknotes or demand deposits. You're in trouble, and uh, and and, but it does allow for you to create more paper money. And so during this war, with that rising demand for for currency, the banks fire up the printing presses and and print new notes more than they really can back back up by the specie in their vaults. Well, the bank runs, in fact, occurred. In 1814, beginning in August of 1814, nationwide runs on the banks ensued. As people figured out, wait, there's a lot more paper money in circulation than we have coin in a vault, way more. And at some point, the bank isn't going to be able to, to redeem all of that. And so, you know how, you know, the panic kind of uh, bank run atmosphere can work. It, it can once it sets in it it's like a freight train it's just no stopping it and so these bank runs are occurring what's going to happen are all the banks going to go under well they would have but the banks suspended their specie payments or suspended specie redemption and they did so for a period of almost two and a half years between the end of 1814 and the early months of 1817 what is, what is this all about? A suspension of specie payments or specie redemption. What this means is that for a temporary period, the bank declares that it will no longer, for this period, redeem its notes for gold, silver or gold coin. So does the bank stop its operations? No, the bank remains open, continues to lend and um, engage in banking activity however and, and its notes continue to circulate and sometimes even the bank will print more notes on top of the existing notes but for this period of time the bank will not redeem its its notes for a coin and banks all across the union responded to this um, to the, this these wartime demands by again increasing paper currency and then suspending specie redemption um, this was essentially the 19th century version of the bank bailout. Okay, we experienced the bank, ba ba the bank bailout in 2008 and 2009. What was that all about? Well, the banks were in huge financial trouble, mostly because of really dumb decisions that they made. They had a bunch of junk assets. And as all that came to light, they were going to go completely under. What did the government do? The government bailed them out. The Federal Reserve bailed them out. Well, this is... Not, you know, there's some big differences here between those two types of bailouts, but this is sort of like the 19th century version of a bank bailout. 
The banks are heavily in debt. Well, how are they in debt? Well, they have these notes in circulation and they're obligated to pay the note holder that sum of coin. That's a debt, right? That's a liability of the bank. It's a liability of the bank and, and so too are the, the demand deposits recorded in book. So by allowing the banks to suspend paying those debts, right? That's a, that's a form of a, a sort of bailout. The risk here is that you end up creating moral hazard. Moral hazard, really, really important term in the history of finance. What is moral hazard? Moral hazard is when you create the in an incentive for a business, or in this case, a bank, to increase its exposure to risk, especially financial risk, because it does not bear the full cost of that risk. Okay, so what do you mean it doesn't bear the full cost of that risk? Well, if things go bad, well, we can rely on a bailout. If things go bad, we can just suspend specie redemption. And then that creates moral hazard because now, well, maybe we're more willing to take a risk because we can rely on that somewhat as a, as a sort of safety net. This creates moral hazard and, and can encourage bad behavior. Nonetheless, a suspension or a bailout can, can preserve the system from just complete collapse. If you don't have the bailout, if you don't have the suspension of specie payments, you're going to have just all across the board, maybe all the banks go under. And you can't have that, can you? Well, some people would argue that might be good to just completely flush out the system. But that would be a very, very, very painful thing. And so usually in these times of fiscal crises, the bailout is the go-to. And it's always said, oh, it's temporary. It's temporary. Uh, but but we need it now to save the system. This is the first bailout in the U.S. history. So banknotes remain in circulation, but now they're not circulating at par. Um, this isn't going to change exchange exactly for $5 anymore. It's going to circulate at a discount. It's going to circulate at a discount. Maybe uh, this note will now circulate at $3. Okay because it's not no longer redeemable. It's no longer convertible into coin. All these notes, now they're, they're not quite worth what they were before. They're still circulating, but at a discount, at a discount. Well, it's in this context. Now the war's over, the war is over, but now we're left with this mess. The banks have suspended specie payments. There's over 200 banks in the country. The financing the war proved to be a headache. And so Congress in 1816, even though it's controlled by the Democratic Republicans, by Jefferson's party, the Congress passes a bill to charter a new, a second Bank of the United States. It's back. It's back. And, yep. And it's chartered because of the mess of the whole system from the War of 1812. And, and that difficulty, difficulty in borrowing money for the war effort. Now, maybe the Second Bank of the United States will help oversee and regulate the system a bit. And the federal government can turn to the central institution to borrow money. All right. Now, opponents of this say, well, that's really risky. You've got one giant institution that you turn to for money. They're going to exert a lot of influence over politics. It's true. Some people say, well, it's good to have to borrow from a wide variety of institutions. But it is less convenient. And so for this reason, among others, the second bank is chartered. It's modeled very closely after the first bank. It issues banknotes, operates on fractional reserves, receives a monopoly federal charter that will last for 20 years, presumably in 1836. Uh, it will be rechartered again with no controversy. I'm sure of that, uh, they say at the time. And uh, it's the only bank that can have branches in every, in every state. So it's pretty much the same 
bank, eh, some very minor differences uh, with the first. It's going to operate as a central bank, essentially, okay? Um, a lender of last resort to the state banks. Now, I say central bank here, and I hesitate a little bit in that because you're still going to have all the different state bank notes, right? This isn't the monop This isn't the only bank note. You're still going to have the state bank notes, okay? You'll have hundreds of them. So it's not a central bank in that sense of, of having a monopoly on note issue. However, it will act and promise to act as a lender of last resort to the state banks. If a state bank is in trouble, the second bank in the United States will, be, will sit there ready to provide liquidity to that bank if it's a sound bank to help keep that bank afloat. That's one of the key functions of a, of a central bank to act as a lender of last resort. So, um, and sure enough, in early 1817, February of 1817, the banks returned to specie redemption on some help from the Bank of the United States, but also uh, Congress passed a law a few months prior to that saying federal government uh, beginning in early 1817 will only accept banknotes that are redeemable for silver and gold coin. And so by and large, all the banks returned to convertibility in 1817. Things seem to be, whew, all right, we got over that crisis and uh, and we're back, we're back. We've got a, a, a bank in the United States again, woohoo. And, uh, and all the state banks, they returned to redemption and convertibility, all right. Um, things seem to be good. There are skeptics, there are skeptics. Remember the, the Thomas Jefferson quote? that I read off in, in lecture 20, where he said the system of banking we have is a blot on our constitutions and went on and on about how dangerous banks are. That quote was from 1816. That's written in this context of all of this is going on. Jefferson, sounding the alarm bell, but by this point, ah, Jefferson, you know, you did, you did, you were great, you know, back in the day, but you know, this is a new era and, and this is the system we've landed upon. That was the attitude among many in Jefferson's own party. And James Madison, who argued in 1791 that the Bank of the United States was unconstitutional, James Madison signed this into law. He was president. He could have vetoed it, chose not to veto it, signed it into law. So things have changed. But next time, next time, boy, we are going to witness the first great financial panic and depression in our country's history and it happens in the context of this banking bubble following the war of 1812 and the chartering of the second bank of the united states so i look forward to seeing you for part b